Good evening, everyone. I'm Tracy Noah from the Marion Library Service, and welcome to our Library to the Lens live webinar with special guest author Rachel Mead. Since the closure of our libraries and venues, we've been working hard to still connect and engage with you through our Library to the Lens series of adult programs delivered differently. We had to reimagine how to bring you the author talks that you've grown to expect from us, so thank you for joining us today. This evening, Rachel, a poet, widely published writer, an arts reviewer, and the author of four collections of poetry, will share with us her debut novel, The Application of Pressure, that takes the reader to the front line of Australia's emergency services. Please feel free at any time during the presentation to type questions you have for Rachel into the Q&A text box on your screen, and I'll ask her these at the end of her talk. Rachel has chosen local bookshops, imprints, booksellers in the city, and Matilda Bookshop in Stirling as her preferred booksellers for this event. Both stores sell her books, so please make sure you support local and contact one of these suppliers to grab your copy of The Application of Pressure. Now sit back, grab a cuppa or glass of wine, and please welcome Rachel. Hello. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, Tonight, uh, before we get going, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you tonight from the land of the Paramank people. Um, and um, it's a real honour to be here talking about stories um, on, on land where people have been telling stories. Our first storytellers um, were, uh, were telling stories for over 60,000 years and um, sovereignty uh, on the, of this land was never ceded. So thank you so much to Marion Library and to Tracy Noah for, um, for inviting me to speak tonight. And thank you all uh, for joining me. Um, I think um, there are even uh, people uh, beaming in <laughs> from, uh, from uh, the UK. So normally, um, under normal circumstances, this sort of event would be um, attended by like four of my closest friends. <laughs> so it's um, a, a, even though this year has been so terrible in so many ways, um, one uh, yeah small silver lining has been uh, this the level of, of accessibility and um, and connection that that has grown with the shifting of all of these uh, sessions online. So tonight, um, I'm going to speak about, uh, just tell you a little bit about my novel, um, The Application of Pressure, which is, um, yeah, my first novel. And it's about, it follows the story of two paramedics, Tash and Joel, as um, uh, it follows them through their career working on uh, the medical front lines uh, here in Adelaide. And um, so as paramedics, uh, they go to work every day and uh, face a, a significant amount of, of trauma just as part and parcel of their daily working life. And uh, really what I wanted to do with this novel is to explore the question of, um, of what um, constant exposure to trauma as a result of, um, of working as a paramedic, what is the effect that that, um, that has on uh, paramedics' lives and, um, and on their relationships? So, um, uh, the, so the story, um, each chapter in the book uh, is based around a particular emergency or, um, or a situation that, uh, that needs a, a, param a paramedic case, basically. Uh, so, uh, so we, and it, the, the book is also, um, it stretches over um, just over 20 years um, in time. So it follows Tash and Joel, from their very first days as paramedic trainees in 1997 uh, to uh, almost the present day. So just uh, the turning of the year 2020. So um, yeah, bizarrely just uh, pre-pandemic. Um, so the, and the reason um, that I've written these stories is, uh, is because I just happen to be married to a paramedic. Um, so um, my, my husband has uh, worked for the South Australian Ambulance Service for the past 23 years. And we were together when, uh, when he first uh, started training as a, as a paramedic. And um, so 
it became quite clear to me uh, from very early on that his um, uh, paramedics are just absolutely fascinating to people. Um, it's, uh, it is a really interesting thing to watch from, um, from an outsider perspective. Um, not only, um, uh, the, not only uh, are people fascinated by, um, by the jobs and want to hear all of the amazing stories, but um, yeah, the questions that they ask are really interesting as well. So from an outsider perspective, I, I find um, profiling people by the questions that they ask really interesting as well. So, um, yes, so it didn't take me long to realise that as a, um, as a writer married to a paramedic, um, I, yeah, I was sitting on a really, um, an interesting gold mine. Um, so, um, I, I decided to, um, to write the stories, but not just in, um, I, I didn't want it to be a, a voyeuristic take on, um, on just recounting the, the grisly and macabre uh, details of, of um, a paramedic's working life. I, I wanted to, um, to look more deeply into the culture of emergency service work and really explore uh, what uh, the impact of the job on people's lives. Uh, paramedics are, are, are just, the most remarkable and phenomenal people. Um, any anyone who can see somebody um, who needs help, who can see an emergency, and their first instinct is to run towards that rather than to um, yeah rather than to step back. Um, yeah, it, it's a um, it is only a very um, a very rare and particular sort of person I think um, has the has the skills and the personality um, that really sets them up uh, to be a paramedic and um, but because of what they're exposed to as a result of their working life and this constant exposure uh, to to trauma it's um, they're far more vulnerable than the average person um, a, you know the general member of the public to um, to stress and trauma related disorders, and and um, as a as a consequence of their job, they're also uh, far more vulnerable to um, to being physically assaulted in the workplace as well. So um, so the the potential there for um, uh, for the um, the exposure to trauma to um, uh, to be uh, significantly impactful in their life is is really significant, and um, so that's one of the things that um, that I wanted to look at as well. And that's um, in the characters of um, of Tash and Joel. Uh, they um, they both have come. Um, I, I use them in the book to explore different types of PTSD. Now I'm sort of getting ahead of myself on my little um, list of things that I want to talk about. So I'm going to um, stop right there and give you. Um, I'm going to do a little reading from the book, uh, just to um, just to give set the scene and give you a little um, taste of of um, what the book is about. So um, uh, I will. Oh, I haven't started on the right page. Here we are. Okay, so this story is based in uh, 2001. The yelp and wail of the siren packs the ambulance with sound. Joel swings out of the Savas Yeros car park onto Unley Road, their meals turning the air into an unnatural hybrid of disinfectant and kebab. A horn blares. In her side mirror, Tash sees a prick in a BMW flash his lights but Joel doesn't even dignify him with a glance. The traffic's still pretty heavy for this time of night, but it's the Friday of the Queen's birthday weekend. Red light at Unley and Cross and the cars are three deep, both lanes. The traffic responds to the siren and stops. The driver's waiting to see what the ambulance will do. Joel bumps the vehicle over the median strip and Tash steadies herself grabbing the Jesus bar and checking the traffic on the left. Clear. Joel floors it through the intersection, swerving from the wrong side of the road back into the queue of taillights, a Hyundai creeping along in the outside lane with the driver 
oh sorry i've missed a word there there's a, there's a Hyundai creeping along in the outside lane with a driver who must be deaf and blind not to clock them roaring up behind him. He sticks to the right. Joel flashes the high beams. Move it, dick for brains. Still no joy. Tash leans over and flicks the siren mode so it gives a couple of sharp yips. From behind, it looks like the guy jumps so high he cracks his head. She can only hope. It's been years since driving priority one got Tasha's adrenaline pumping. The thrill eroded so gradually that she only really notices it's gone when people ask about the job. Other than how many gunshot wounds she's seen, what it feels like to drive lights and sirens is usually the first thing they want to know. Everyone must get so worn down by the peak hour commute that the idea of ignoring speed limits and red lights gets them as excited as Sandra Bullock in speed. Hollywood has so much to answer for. Tash did three years of clinical study and then, just before graduation, two weeks of driver training. For her, that ratio really sums it up. It's always been about the work, not the flashy transport. But still, it's weird how quickly she got used to it, desensitised to the rush. After the first year, driving priority one didn't even raise her heart rate. It just meant she had to put down her falafel. The next couple of lights are green. The cars are spread out, so Joel makes easy work of weaving around the ones that don't or won't get out of the way. Once the ambulance nears the railway line, it gets trickier. The traffic sluggish as the road narrows. He leans on the horn and flashes the lights. After the Springbank corner, the road is quieter. It's the foothills, so while there's less traffic, there's also less light. The road begins to snake up towards Belair, and Joel has to slow for the tight bends. Tash checks the UBD. We should be coming up on it in, a cup, in a, about half a click, she says, reaching for a couple of pairs of gloves and safety glasses. Here we go. Joel nods at the windshield, as he slows the ambulance, pulling to a stop so the headlights shine on the scene in front of them. There's a car pulled over awkwardly on the left and a motorbike on its side on the downhill edge of the road, one wheel lodged under the road barrier. Two young men run towards the ambulance, arms semaphoring wildly. A figure is lying on the road, hard up against the curb. A third young guy is kneeling beside him, eyes wide and bright in the glare of the headlights as he pumps awkwardly on the figure's leather-clad chest. His rhythm's bad, the compressions are way too shallow, and he's not stopping to breathe into the motorcyclist's airway. A damaged motorcycle helmet lies on the road a couple of metres away, pale scrape marks on its black finish. Tash and Joel leap from the ambulance and grab their kits. The motorcyclist and the young guy are shaded from the street lights by some enormous pine trees, so the scene is lit only by the ambulance's headlights. The figures cast long black shadows that stripe the road like staves on sheet music. Joel heads for the two bystanders, deftly turning them away from the scene while Tash makes a beeline for the motorcyclist. She kneels down and immediately regrets it. Her knees have landed in a pool of vomit. The motorcyclist is unconscious, but his mouth is open and he's gulping like a goldfish out of water. There's a deep graze across his cheek and brow and one of his shoulders looks low and distinctly dislocated. Tash knows she needs to check the rest of him since he's probably sustained multiple limb fractures, but notes that on, that on a mental to-do list. Right now, he's got more serious issues. He's trying to breathe, he can't breathe. The young guy's voice cracks with stress. Don't worry, we've got this. I'm Tash and that's Joel. What's your name? Sorry, I couldn't help it. He looks down at the vomit. The poor guy can't be more than 20. He's crying, tears shining on thick eyelashes. For a microsecond, Tash is distracted by the fact that the kid is drop dead gorgeous. Huge dark eyes, olive skin and bone structure like he's just stepped out of an ad for Dolce & Gabbana. He looks familiar, but she can't place him. Don't worry, 
happens all the time. Tash shifts her knees, but the dampness is already seeping through her uniform. Great. What's your name? Mazar. His voice is shaky and probably a little higher than usual. Mazar, you're doing really well. I'm just going to check him over, so I need you to keep going with the compressions, just for a minute. You know the song, Staying Alive? The Bee Gees? That's the rhythm we need. Tash puts her hands over his and starts to sing in a terrible attempt at a Barry Gibb falsetto, pumping firmly on the rider's sternum to the beat. Ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive. He picks up the rhythm and with the compressions uh, starts to sing, his voice soft, deep and perfectly pitched to harmonise with hers. Great Mazar, beautiful voice. This is far from good. Tash has seen this weird goldfish gulping before. The guy's not actually gasping for breath. It's a mechanical reaction, the brainstem's last ditch effort to keep firing. It means critical brain injury. Half the writer's face is deep in shadow, but there's a pool of growing, uh, there's a growing pool of blood darkening the bitumen around his head in an opaque halo. There must be a serious skull fracture back there. Tash eases back his eyelids and flicks the beam from her penlight over them. Just as she expected, fixed and dilated, he's already dead. Oh, okay. So um, I, that gives you an indication of um, one of the, the more serious um, and yeah, relatively confronting um, stories in the book. Um, uh, but that, yeah, I hasten to add, they are not, they are not all like that. Um, but um, that story is part of um, a character trajectory that is important in showing the, um, uh, uh, the effects and consequences of, um, of post-traumatic stress. And so, as I was saying before I realised that I'd completely forgotten to do a reading to begin with, um, the characters of Tash and Joel, um, while uh, are both, um, I'm using them in a way um, so that to explore different, um, different types of um, stress and trauma-related disorder. So in the book, uh, Joel, uh, there's a chapter where he, um, he goes on secondment to the Solomon Islands as a helicopter retrieval paramedic. And while he's there, he um, witnesses a particularly uh, violent and horrendous um, act. And, it's, and so his character trajectory is um, it's looking at um, uh, the PTSD that arises um, as a result of witnessing um, a, 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 or experiencing a, a, a trauma. So, um, but in a, in a single incident. So in Joel's situation, he's the witness to it, but he's um, unable to, he's powerless to do anything about it. So, and, and that's important because um, it's often that um, these, um, these sorts of um, uh, problems arise when a person uh, doesn't feel that, they've ha that they have any agency in the situation. So they're not able to um, do anything to help. They're sort of just um, this helpless bystander who's... Um, uh, and uh, so that's how... Um, that's the instigating incident for Joel's issues that carry on throughout the book. Tash, um, who, uh, this is the, um, the short reading that I just did then, this is one of the incidents that's, um, uh, that goes towards her problems, which arise from um, the cumulative effect of daily exposure to trauma. So it's, um, so while there's not one particular instigating incident, um, because of the nature of her work, uh, she comes face to face with things that are genuinely distressing uh, throughout, um, th throughout the book. And so those gradually start to compound and, um, and we see that play out in the disintegration of her mental health and, um, and also some and her relationships. So, um, so that's how um, 
that's how the book sort of looks at, um, uh, sort of tries to answer the question that I wanted to, uh, that I was asking myself when I began, you know, what is the, what is the, um, how do people, how do paramedics cope, basically? Um, when it comes to, um, uh, because many of these stories are um, based on my husband's experiences, um, what, and um, a part of our day-to-day -day, um, sort of um, a domestic routine, basically, is um, is being very conscious of the fact that um, that as a paramedic, these are real and significant and uh, issues that that any day he could walk out the door to work and um, and see something or be involved in something that um, that is uh, truly traumatic and stressful. And so, um, basically, when he started work. We got into the routine of um, of I would he would get home and I would um, that whole oh how was your day dear that just wouldn't cut it we had to um, yeah I really had to encourage him to talk uh, deeply about not just what happened in um, because the what he, these stories are really interesting, and you could, and he he could just say, "Well, this happened, and then this happened, and this happened," but um, really, because we were trying to get um, get into the the flow of um, of him being able to talk about how um, how um, he, what he did and what he was thinking and how he was feeling about each of um, of what he was seeing. Um, so I was learning how to ask. Um, oh, the questions that really dug away at um, at that sort of protective layer and um, got to the got to the heart of of um, of his daily life and and I guess as a result of twenty years of um, of being in the habit of um, of getting of of these work conversations with um, with Andrew, we. Um, I was ended up being in this very privileged position of actually having a reasonable understanding of um, what a paramedic um, thought and felt um, when um, when going about their um, their day to day work. And so I'm hoping that the stories that I've collected together um, into this novel, um, yeah, is I'm able to. Um, slip the reader into the skin of a paramedic and give the reader a really um, a, a full understanding of, um, well, as good an understanding as I possibly can of what it is like um, to, to go to work as a paramedic and not just see the confronting aspects of the work. Um, I've got to, got to say um, that um, I've, so I realised that I have suddenly made it sound like this is just um, story after story of um, of horrendous, confronting, um, gory incidents. That's not um, that's that's not the case at all. Because another aspect of emergency service and paramedic culture that is I, I really wanted to dig into and and to get across to the reader is um, uh, black humour. Um, Anyone who has a paramedic or a uh, emergency service worker in their life will know that generally speaking, they have excellent senses of humor. They're, it's very dry and dark and twisted. <laughs> not, not all of them, I'm that, sorry, that's um, it's a gross generalization. But, um, but generally speaking, um, and they're great, generally great storytellers as well. And one of the things that I've come to realise from um, from talking to other paramedics and um, is that um, I think that black humour is um, a bit of an unconscious coping mechanism. And I, when when I was trying to um, think about it, I thought, well, that really does make sense because by looking at things, um, by looking at uh, quite confronting and horrendous incidents, but through a frame of or a perspective of humour, it um, it allows them a way in to start talking about things. And of course, um, that um, a, such an important part of dealing with trauma is being able to talk about it. Um, I know. Um, so.
basically, um, that's another aspect of this um, of this book is that I'm trying to impart is the importance of the importance of storytelling as a way of of dealing with trauma. So, the um, when I when I first started writing, it was very much a um, uh, I, I came to writing these stories as a poet. Um, so really, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and um, I was very lucky in that um, I had an excellent, um, I had an excellent writing mentor and, um, and a very supportive bunch of, of friends and, um, and beta readers and like a whole community of people who were very generous and supportive and helpful. But um, my, um, my writing mentor is um, Rebecca Clarkson. Whose, um, whose novel, Barking Dogs, um, was released a couple of years ago. And she's also one of um, Australia's most preeminent short story writers. So um, I'm a little bit embarrassed to recount this now because I remember giving her my very first short story and it was very, um, um, it, it basically was almost a, um, a flat recounting of an oral story that I had heard from, um, from a, um, my husband, from an, as from a paramedic perspective. And she very kindly read it. And, um, and basically, um, as our relationship and the mentorship went on, she revealed to me all of the, um, the ways in which um, uh, short stories are such a, they, uh, I don't, it was, short stories from a, um, a literary perspective, um, I don't know what I was thinking trying to start writing prose with a short story because they are the most challenging of the, um, the literary um, art forms, I think, because basically you're trying to compress all of the techniques that go into making a really interesting and deep and rich novel, you're trying to compress that into a few thousand words. So, um, so all of the character development and the, um, and the themes and the um, um, plot and um, narrative arc and oh, basically you're just trying to do everything in a very, very um, compressed space. Um, so I was very lucky that um, yeah, she took me under her wing and um, and helped me through um, polishing these stories and deepening these stories so that um, when I put them all together, um, yeah, they um, they weren't they had lost that um, the aspect of the yarn, um, which um, while I, some of them. Uh, which is important to retain because that is how um, uh, I think because storytelling is something that I'm, you know, as is one of the themes of the book. And so um, I really wanted to retain a little bit of that flavour. But it's really interesting when you try, when somebody, um, when you tell a story in the pub and somebody says, oh, that's an excellent story, you should write that down. And when you transform it into the written word, um, yeah, and you read it as a piece of writing. Yeah, there's um, it's it's lacking something in the in the translation. It's what works as a spoken story does not necessarily work as a as a piece of writing. Um, yeah, so um, um, so oh, sorry, I've, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, right, storytelling. Where was I? Right, um, humour, yes, um, and I, what I also wanted to say about storytelling and the fact that um, so many of the stories in the book are based on real life experiences, um, I also needed to talk a little bit about the, how, how that worked in terms of um, translation of um, real life incidents to um, into a novel, because I'm sure the lawyers among you are thinking, oh my goodness, the ethical considerations, oh, she's gonna be sued. Um, there was a great deal of, um, there was a, um, while the, um, the stories <clears throat> are, um, are based on real life incidents, um, all of the identifying aspects of those stories were um, were changed. So um, 
So the not just the the names and um, that, so not just fictionalizing the characters, but all of the details in terms of the the dates and locations and the cultural heritage. So um, no one will be able to recognize themselves in in the book. So, um, uh, but that being said, it was really important to and on of course the main characters tash and joel are completely fictional um, creations i know um, it's going to be tempting for those of you who know my husband to think oh joel is based on him no um, both tash and joel are, com are completely fictional and there isn't a um this, there isn't a female paramedic running around on whom um, i base the character of tash either um, but that being said the medical, it was really important to make sure that what they would, while their characters are fictional, what they're doing is, um, was as close um, to based in reality as I could possibly make it. And so um, I, would, I would write the stories and then I would um, immediately give them to Andrew, my husband, to, um, to fact check absolutely everything to do with um, paramedic process and medical equipment and and um yeah so everything that they see and do is as close to um as close to uh, realism as i can make it um which was um yeah which of course was really important for um yeah for being able to for um, what because i wanted to try and give uh, readers as um as realistic an idea as possible of uh, what the job of what the job is like. Um, and um, so the book is also based in Adelaide, um, uh, which is exciting um, because, yeah, we, um, there aren't, uh, it's, it, that was fun. That was a fun aspect of the book, I've got to say, um, basing it in Adelaide. And I really wanted to get away from the, um, all of the stereotypes that people have about Adelaide. So like, I just wanted to really get rid of that um, churches and serial killers idea. Um, yeah, so there, um, no moles balls, no lights vision, no snowtown barrels. There's, um, yeah, I tried to, um, uh, to see the um, to see the book with um, a lot of detail that will really resonate with uh, with locals, um, and and hopefully um, flesh out um, the um, yeah sort of the the atmosphere and the character of Adelaide uh, for people that don't live here. Um, it's but there were and doing and writing that because it's the book starts in 1997. Um, there was a lot, I oh, got really nostalgic having to think about, oh, back in the late 90s, oh, what was, what, what was on Rundle Street? What was on Hindley Street? What was, yeah, so the book is full of lots of references. There are lots of references to, um, to pubs and eateries and takeaway food places. And that's, um, that's deliberate because of the whole, um, uh, you know, what's important to paramedics of course if you're on night shift you know exactly where all of the um yeah all the best places to eat around adelaide are so and um and also there are um there are lots of um geographic references and that's another aspect of trying to slip the reader into the paramedics um, mindset because um yeah, as you can imagine, having to drive all over the metropolitan area, often at priority one speed, you need an excellent sense of geography and, um, and navigation. So, um, yes, um, so that's another, that was another reason that there are so many little um, bits and pieces of geographic information about Adelaide in there. Okay, um, I might just... Um, finish with a another um, a short reading um, just to give you um, another little taste of the book and then I will answer some questions okay uh, okay now I just need to give you a little bit of information about this uh, story before I begin it's set in Yulara um, just near Uluru and in a little clinic there and uh, 
Tash is treating a, um, an elderly gentleman who's come in from a station called Colin and Clarissa is the clinic nurse who's also um, um, helping out with the job. Tash takes hold of the heel of the damp boot and eases it off Colin's foot. Inside, the sock is dripping and out of the boot, a rivulet of dank, tarry fluid splatters the lino at Tash's feet. She can feel a couple of drops splash her shin between her own boots and the cuff of her cargo shorts. It takes every effort not to shudder and immediately scrub her skin with disinfectant. The smell engulfs her. It is an unholy mix of hot, rotting seaweed and cat piss with undertones of a compost bin full of meat sitting in the sun. Colin, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say, you've got a doozy of an infection brewing in there. I'm gonna ease your sock off now. So sorry if it hurts, but I need to see what's going on under there. Ready? Tash glances over Colin's shoulder at Clarissa who is standing several metres behind the gurney, mop and bucket ready to go, angled for a good view, but distant enough that breathing is still an option. The look of total repulsion on her face would have made Tash smile, were she not standing at ground zero. Tash rolls a stool between her and Colin, lays a clean towel on the top, then rests the heel of Colin's manky foot on the seat. Here we go. She pulls the top of the sock away from Colin's ankle and starts to peel it gently from his foot. The skin beneath is pale and slick, like it's been in the bath far too long, except for the angry crimson of the infection webbing the ankle and top of the foot. Through the gloves, she can feel the woolen sock is saturated and hot from the fevered skin beneath. The smell hangs in the air like an evil presence. Clarissa cranks up the overhead fans for some circulation, which seems like a good idea, but within a minute, the stench pollutes every corner of the clinic, eliminating any refuge. Tash pulls the sock over the heel, pausing when she hears Colin suck in, her, uh, in a breath through his teeth. How are you going? Need a break? Nah, keep going. Now the boot's off, it feels a bit better. I kept the sock on to soak up the blood, but whenever I took the boot off, the flies went crazy. So I've been sleeping with it on. Feels good to get the damn thing off. Tash bends back to the sock, hoping Colin didn't notice her face. She steals herself for maggots. In fact, maggots might be a benefit, cleaning out the infection and doing the job the owner of the foot has spectacularly failed at. Tash slides her gloved fingers into the sock pulling it away from the skin and easing it over the bunion and toes until the foot sits there, naked and vulnerable under the cool fluorescent lights. She drops the sock on the floor. It hits the lino with a solid splat. Colin has been holding his breath, head tipped back so he's looking at the ceiling tiles. Ooh, that's mighty tender, he says, in what Tash thinks may be a world record for understatement. It's mighty infected is what it is. Tash cradles his foot in her palm. It's mottled with red welts that make the skin an angry map tracing the path of every blood vessel in Colin's foot. She lifts it up to look more closely at the wound. You haven't had much luck with, these, with this foot, have you? When did you lose the toes? What? Colin yanks his foot from her hand and bends over. What the hell? His voice is cracking with panic. He gazes down at his foot, his big and little toes with their thick horn-like nails angled towards each other, but not quite touching the middle one. All three surviving toes look fungal bleared and exposed with their second and fourth comrades missing in action. You came in here with all your toes? Tash feels her mouth has dropped open. She needs to do something, say something. But for several seconds, she just stands there, gloved hands showing their palms to Colin as if she is a magician, demonstrating that she hasn't stashed his toes up her sleeves. She looks down at the discarded sock, picking it up. She flips it inside out. Colin's missing toes tumble onto the stool, plump as small, damp slugs, the unclipped nails glaringly white against the black, dead flesh. 
Oh, okay. So I might uh, see whether Tracy has any questions for me. Yeah, hi Rachel. Yes, we do have some questions. So we'll read the first one out from Liz. So she says, congratulations on your novel. What are you working on next? And what emergencies will be featured in your next novel? Oh, <laughs> oh well, thanks Liz. Um, uh, I'm, I'm moving away from emergency service workers for my next book. Um, the next one is going to be um, uh, based in Antarctica and um, it's going to be a bit of a um, historical fiction looking at the, um, the life of um, uh, Nell Law, who was the first Australian woman to set foot on Antarctica and she was also a visual artist. So, um, yes. Uh, it will be, there won't be any missing toe. Oh, there might be some missing toes. Who knows? There might be frostbite involved, but I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm anticipating that it won't be quite as emergency service focused as this one. Excellent. Sounds fascinating. Um, what else have we got? As a poet, how did you find the transition to writing stories? Oh, that's a really good question. Really difficult, I've got to say. Um, this, what, uh, yes, as it's such a different um, uh, literary form. So, um, it, uh, there, um, one of the biggest challenges I found was writing dialogue um, in, a, of course, that a skill that is very rarely used in poetry. Uh, so, um, I, having to tune my ear for dialogue um, was uh, was that that was a really steep learning curve. In fact, the entire learning curve, um, uh, moving from poetry to prose, was incredibly steep. I um, I found that um, the oh uh, there there I I had this idea in my mind that because I was a, um, a, an avid reader that, um, that it would somehow just flow out of me. Um, but of course, uh, I very swiftly realised that um, while I'm a, um, a, um, I love reading, I'm not a particularly um, critical reader when it comes to working out how ex exactly a writer has achieved the effects that they have in their work. So um, I start reading and I, even when I'm conscious of the fact, right, I love this writer, I think sh um, she's amazing, I really want to learn from her and I start reading and so swiftly I am just um, in the pleasure zone. I'm just reading, um, it's just, I'm just um, swimming in the story and not actually at all conscious of the techniques that are being used to create that pleasure. So, um, yeah, I had to learn a new way to read. Um, and, um, and then once I'd started, um, yeah, being a bit more critical with my reading, then um, it became a little easier, but it really was um, the help. Um, I relied so heavily on the help of other um, fantastic novelists and short story writers um, in my um, it, um, in my um, very supportive circle of friends to help me along. And yeah, I learned so much from them. Yes. That's great. Um, empathy must have been a huge thing to manage in the writing. I wonder if you've made your way into either of your protagonists. Uh, oh, that's a, that is also an interesting question. Uh, Mm. I have definitely picked little details from my life um, and used them to to flesh out um, uh, sort of incidents and um, uh, and domestic situations. Um, but uh, uh, oh, in, in terms of um, it, I really Joel and Tash were. Um, exercises in um yeah in in pure empathy in term yeah uh, they they are very much created from scratch um and yeah it's um uh so oh that is a real that's yes um and i think there was a layer of self-protection in there as well because i think uh delving not being suited to um, to being a paramedic, I'm such a wuss when it comes to um, 
to blood and gore. Oh, I'm, I can't even watch a horror film. So, um, so really, I was um, there was a two-step empathy process. So I was um, sort of slipping, trying to slip into Andrew, into my husband's um, mindset, and then apply that mindset uh, to Joel. And yeah, and Tash was really difficult because um, um, I yeah, that's um, to try and uh, that the female perspective um, to to put that onto a paramedic. Yeah, she was she was challenging to write, but I ended up I love her so much. Yeah, she is such a can do. I really I I really think I would I would love to have Tash as a friend. <laughs> I think she'd be excellent fun. <laughs> Great. So that leads into our next question. How did you find writing a man and a woman differed? Ooh, that is, an, yes, uh, that, that, was, um, that was challenging. To begin with, um, because the stories were so, um, when I first started, they were um, so closely based on, um, on my husband's um, uh, stories. Uh, even, uh, even Joel's um, uh, verbal mannerisms and tics um, were were taken from Andrew, and I had to get rid of those altogether. Um, yeah, it's um, and all of the stories to begin with were from a male perspective, um, just because that was um, they were the stories that I was used to hearing because um, I was hearing stories from from my husband and my husband's friends um, who were predominantly men um, and. <laughs> Then I re my feminist side kicked in after the first one, um, like the first draft was finished, and I just thought, no, this is this is ridiculous. This is playing into that um, this the stereotype that emergency service workers are all men, and that is not the case, especially with um, the paramedic, um, the SA ambulance service. The and I think ambulance services across Australia that the the gender split in um, of paramedics is about 50-50. So I, I thought, no. And then I rewrote all of the stories from a female perspective. And then I realized that, no, that's not, I needed, I needed two protagonists, um, you know, as I was saying before, because of, um, to deal with the two different uh, types of um, uh, uh, traumatic stress uh, disorder that I was looking at. But I also needed, um, I needed a really solid friendship and I needed um, to a male and female to show, um, to, um, to really bring out that banter as well, sort of that black humour, the jokey, um, yeah, that, um, that sort of um, very uh, paramedic-esque <laughs> way of, of um, conversing and interacting. So um, then I went back and changed them to, um, so some of the stories are from Tasha's perspective, some are from Joel's perspective and yeah. So that's how that happened. So well, this is exciting because we've got a question from Jen next and she's uh, streaming in from the UK. So that's very exciting. Oh, that's my sister-in-law. Hi, Jen. <laughs> she says, I wanted to ask, do you miss Tash and Joel now that the book is finished and is there a chance they might return in another book? Oh, <laughs> I see what you're doing there, Jen. Um, that's, oh, that's lovely. Uh, yes, I do, I do miss them, to tell you the truth. Um, after spending so long with them, this book took me a very long time to write. So, um, yeah, it's, um, I'm lucky in that, um, yeah, I have a paramedic at home, so I don't miss them too much. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm not uh, at the moment. I'm not. Um, uh, there's not. They're not necessarily a sequel in the works. But um, yeah. But who knows? That's. Um, I might miss them enough that yeah, that they come back and and yeah, and we follow them to retirement or something. Who knows? <laughs> Um, Jill says she's enjoying, enjoying your talk and the phrase married to the job, how does an emergency worker's relationship to others in the same job compare to relationships outside the job? Do you think there is a closer tie to people who share the same experiences? That is a really interesting question. And I, I do think that it just, um, I, I take 
my my answer to this um, goes back to what I um, what I observe just in um, the um, among the the paramedics and um, and medical workers that I know. Um, it does seem to be uh, very common for um, for paramedics to either be in relationships with um, with other paramedics or other sort of allied health professionals. So um, there are you know substantial um, there are lots of um, paramedics who have relationships um, with doctors and nurses and um, yeah and and other. Um, uh, emergency service workers. So um, I think there might be something to that. I think that um, that, re that other people in, um, in the medical field, maybe there is that, um, that sense of commonality and yeah, that, um, that is, uh, that, that is a, um, a, that makes for a very uh, long lasting and, um, and empathetic and understanding relationship. So um, I, while it's obviously not, um, I mean, I'm a writer married to a paramedic, so it's not unheard of for, um, yeah, for people to marry outside the profession. Um, I, it is um, there, it, yeah, there, I, I would, I think, it's my understanding that there are more, that um, there are more um, medical um, pairings than um, like medical, non-medical pairings. Makes sense. Um, Angela says, how long did you spend on this book from start to publication? And can you tell us again who was your mentor? Because she missed the name. Oh, okay. Rebecca Clarkson. Um, and her book is Barking Dogs, um, published with a firm press. And she is, yeah, look up her work. She is an amazing um, writer. Um, and, yeah, her book Barking Dogs is based in Mount Barker. So, and, yeah, fantastic. Um, sorry, and the first part of that question. Oh, how uh, long did it take you to write from? Oh, how long it took me to write? Ooh, freaking forever. The first, um, I wrote my first ever short story in 2012, and it wasn't a paramedic story actually, it was a CFS story, a um, country fire service um, story. And um, and from there, and then a couple of paramedics appeared in that story, and then yeah, then the rest is history. And that so, um, so that was the very first story. And then um, yeah, basically I finished the um, the the draft that I eventually submitted to a firm press in uh, 2019, and um, but. And, and that sounds horrendous, but I wasn't working on it solidly the entire time. Like I was publishing uh, two books of poetry. I did a PhD. I, you know, worked on other things. So, um, yeah, it's um, it eight years, but not eight years solidly just with my head down, um, yeah, writing these stories. So it's not as bad as it sounds. So that leads us into our last question. Is your next novel going to take eight years or when will oh. it? <laughs> oh, I really hope not. Oh, oh, that would, that would just be soul destroying. I would really love to have the first draft done in a year. That's my goal. So, yeah. Whoever cheekily asked that question, check back with me next June and then, yeah, we'll see. That was actually really <laughs> so, yeah. But that's how it's going to be ready next June because you can probably come and join us in person and tell us all about that one. Uh, that, yes, that would be lovely. Um, it's it's really interesting. I'm I'm sort of um, while I'm really enjoying the the level of um, connectivity that um, these online sessions are bringing. Um, yeah, it's it, it's going to be. Um, I sort of I do miss that aspect of um, uh, uh, the face to face. But, but then again, I don't know how many of you are out there and if you were all gathered in a room and um, it would probably be quite daunting. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> so this is just another quick question from me, a cheeky one. So does your, I'm just curious if your nostalgic settings from the late 90s include Lenny's Tavern? 
No, I I didn't include Lenny's Tavern. I'm sorry. It's um there's Rio's in Hindley Street, Al Fresco's on Rundle Street, and of course the Exeter, which is just the I don't know. That just seems to be the uh, um the Adelaide icon of a pub. Yeah. So um yeah no I. Um, uh, Dumpling King makes it in there. I don't think Dumpling King was around in the 90s, though. Yeah, so sorry, scrap that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we don't have any more questions unless there's anything else you want to share with us tonight, Rachel. Oh, no. Look, thank you so much for, um, for inviting me. And, I've, yeah, I've had a great time. And thank you, everyone, um, for, for tuning in. I really appreciate, really appreciate the support. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us. So your book sounds fascinating and I agree the life and experiences of a paramedic must be so um, ever-changing and rewarding as well as extremely stressful. So a huge thank you to all of our frontline emergency workers out there and thank you to you for bringing us an insight into their lives. Oh, thank you so much. Excellent. And please keep following the Marion Library's Facebook page, the City of Marion website and check your inbox to be kept up to date on all of the upcoming Library Through the Lens presentations and workshops. If you haven't already registered, next Tuesday morning we welcome wellbeing educator and author Annie Harvey as she talks about The Little Book of Still, the book that she wrote after a request from someone in the audience at her TEDx talk. So we hope you'll join us then and thank you once again to Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.